So hello everyone, it's 3 p.m. in time in Denmark. So I've seen that you're coming from lots of countries, so different time zones. And uh, really nice to meet you and nice to welcome you for this webinar of today. Uh, so before we start, I will um, introduce you, uh, I will share my screen with a few rules before going to the presentation of the two speakers of today, Danny and Anthony. Um, so let me share my screen. So welcome to this webinar about wildlife and conservation photography. And uh, yes, a few rules for this meeting. So we are going to ask you to keep you all muted uh, during this webinar. So we can all hear the presentation and uh, have my experience. Today we are going to have a presentation on wildlife and conservation photography um, with our two presenters. After the presentation, uh, for, from the two presenters, we'll have time for questions to our presenter, Danny Gisborn and Anthony Oching. And if you have any requests during the meeting, please wave your hands and ask the question so you can ask the question directly on the chat. We will collect them and try to come back to them uh, after the presentation. Also, if you wish to receive a diploma of participation, write your name and email on private chat directly to me, Florian Marier. So you can find me if you go down on chat, there is two and you can select my name to directly write me privately to not disturb the the chat with everyone. Uh, so if you have a question about this, also ask me. It's Florian Marie. After the webinar, we'll ask you to kindly answer um, some questions and if you have suggestions for other topics. And uh, we will record this webinar and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and also on Wiry website. And we also welcome you for another webinar on the 5th of June about the mental and physical benefits of outdoor education. So we will have more information about that, but we'll be really happy to welcome you for this other webinar. For today's webinar, so it's the topic of the day will be about wildlife and conservation photography with two uh, presenters. First, we will have the presentation of Danny Gitzman, which is a photographer who concentrates on wildlife and outdoor imagery especially local nature, both common and rare, and is also really invested and engaged in uh, education and conservation. So it will be the second part of the webinar. So we have the first technical part about wildlife photography and second part about conservation photography. So maybe lots of you don't know what is conservation photography yet, but you will know more after. So Anthony Oshing is the founder of Tony Wild, a platform for promoting conservation action by creating awareness on wildlife conservation through photography, film, and science. So if you have any question at this point and any requests, please ask on chat and enjoy the webinar. And also we will be really pleased if you can follow us on social media, young, on Facebook, Young Reporter for the Environment, or on Instagram, why are we in? and to be posted on every webinar that is going to happen and all our action on a daily basis. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we will begin with Danny's presentation. Danny, can you hear us? I can, yes. Perfect. Hi guys, and thanks for having me along. I hope you can all see the presentation. Uh, please do type your questions into chat. Uh, I'll not see them as I'm doing the presentation, but uh, by all means, uh, type your questions. I'd love to hear from you, hear your thoughts and answer what questions I can. And I'm a wildlife photographer, as Florian kindly introduced me. Uh, I do some photography and video. I, I do it from a conservation angle and I do it to educate uh, as best as I can. I have a passion for the natural world and I try my best to share that passion through photographs and video. I will start with, uh, I'm not going to talk about video today, I'm going to talk about photography and I'm going to talk about a special type of photography today, which is macro photography. And I'm not sure if you guys uh, have heard of macro photography, but what it is, it's a, a form of close-up imagery 
where we shoot things ultra close up and we use special lenses to do that and it lets us look at small nature in a big big way and it's great for uh, seeing what goes on at the micro level uh, inside flowers insects things like that so uh, i do have a, a, a keen interest in insects and i'm going to talk to you about how you can do that uh, using your photography equipment okay so uh, i will show my equipment at the end i'll not show it now because i'm doing the presentation but i'm sure you're probably uh, going to ask a few questions about what i use uh, and i can answer those at the end and I'll, I'll i'll turn my camera on and show you my my physical equipment at the end uh, but what you need to do macro photography is you need a camera your digital SLR is uh, the best method of doing so, but bridge cameras, and nowadays your smartphone. Uh, I use a Motorola G8 Power smartphone, which has a dedicated macro camera on the back of it, and it's very good for photographing flowers and insects. So, you know, you don't need to invest heavily in your equipment. Uh, you don't need to buy big expensive lenses and things like that. Yes, if you want to invest in it, you will get the best out of your photography, but you can start macro photography with your smartphone. Lenses, as I said, uh, there are dedicated macro lenses. And what they allow you to do is represent what you see as lifelike on the sensor of your camera, okay? So if you see a bee on a flower, that bee will be that size on your sensor, which magnifies it greatly, okay? Tripods and bean bags, we use these in macro photography sometimes to stabilize uh, our equipment. If you're out in the field and it's windy, uh, you may want to stabilize uh, by resting your camera on a bean bag or using a tripod. And obviously you need some accessories and stuff with you, uh, protective wear, uh, keep your camera away from the rain, use rain shields, things like that. And that will uh, get you started on your macro photography. Basically, there are three elements to any photograph. You guys are photographers already, so you will know that there are three main elements to a photograph. There's your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO sensitivity. Uh, these won't be new to you. I'm sure you've all heard of these, uh, and you all know what they are. But how do they work with macro photography? Uh, it's very, very different macro photography. So shutter speeds for macro photography tend to be a lot lower than they would if you were shooting a bird flying in flight. So you'd use a nice quick shutter speed like one over 500 or one over 1000 for your bird in flight. For macro photography, we use slow speeds like one over 100, one over 125, because we are using flash photography with macro all the time. Uh, and I'll talk about that and why we use flash in a minute. But our shutter speeds is the amount of time that we let light hit our sensor. It's very important light plays the biggest part in all of our photography. Without light, we have no photographs. So uh, the shutter speed is the time we allow to do that. The longer the time, the more light, the less time, the less light comes in. Very, very simple, okay? Aperture is your f-stop. It's the, uh, where your shutter speed is the time you let light in for. Your aperture is the amount of light you let in for that time. Okay, and it's an opening in your lens that opens and closes, and it allows a certain amount of light. And you can see from the illustration in the slide that if you shoot at f2, your lens is what we call wide open. And if you shoot at f16, the opening is very small, and we call that stopping down. And in macro photography, we stop down to f8 or f11 or even higher at f16. And the reason we do that is for depth of field. Okay. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard of depth of field when you're, you're taking your photographs uh, and your journalistic photographs and you're recording the scene. You want to have something in focus, but you don't necessarily want everything in focus. You want the background nicely blurred out. And the area that's in focus is called the depth of field of a photograph. Now, that's okay when you're shooting somebody's face and you want their eye in focus like you always do and you've got their eye and their nose and their ear in focus. But what happens if you're shooting the bee, which is to a centimeter long, you have to uh, think about your depth of field. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot shallower. You're dealing with minimal, minimal uh, length of time uh, and length of depth of field. So you know you're talking about millimeters. So you have to be accurate, and you have to shoot at f16 or above or around that to get as much in focus as you can. Okay. So it's important. Depth of field in macro photography is very, very important. OK, 
okay? Their depth of field is tiny. As I say, we shoot at F10 or higher. We want to grab as much focus as we can. So the illustration here is of a carrion beetle. This is a beetle that uh, eats snails. It's uh, specially adapted to eat snails because it's got a long head and it eats its way in the snail shell, pokes its long head in and eats, eats the snail from the outside in, which isn't very nice for the snail, but uh, it makes for a good photograph. And you can see there that I have the face of the beetle in focus and its two eyes are in focus, but the antenna which are facing me are out of focus and the back of the beetle is out of focus. Now that was shot at F13 and all of what's in focus there is about three millimeters. Okay, so that's tiny, tiny focus. But you look at what macro does, it brings out lots of detail. It brings out lots of features that you wouldn't necessarily see on uh, that little carrion beetle as it's walking over uh, the grass in your garden. So depth of field is vitally important in macro photography, as is uh, accurate focus. Remember, when you want to show, you're recording a scene and you're taking a photograph because you want to show somebody else the picture. And you may need to make sure that what your eye sees is what you record. And your eye will always be drawn to the eye of what you're looking at. So you need to get the eye in focus, whether you're shooting a wedding with a bride and groom, whether you're shooting a great white shark out in the ocean, or whether you're shooting this carrion beetle that you can see here. It is vitally important that you get the eye in focus. ISO sensitivity, okay? Uh, ISO is how sensitive your sensor is to light. Uh, so you have your shutter speed is the amount of time you let light in. The aperture is the amount of light you let in for that time. And the ISO is how sensitive your sensor is to that light. So those three things come together in what we call an exposure triangle, okay? And every camera has uh, ISO speeds and settings, and you can set it to auto or you can uh, set it to whatever you want. The higher the number, the more sensitive your sensor is to light, okay? Uh, I tend to shoot at ISO 100 all the time, as much as I can do, uh, because shooting at higher ISOs, although it's more sensitive to light and therefore lets more light in, it creates what we call digital noise in a photograph, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get bogged down too much in the technicalities of digital noise. We could do a webinar on it <laughs> on its own right, but we, yeah, basically what digital noise is, it shows up as graininess in your image, okay? So if you've ever taken a photograph and you've looked at the background and it's very grainy, it's probably been shot at a higher ISO, okay? So to keep your image nice and clean, and to keep it nice and, and smooth backgrounds, uh, you want to shoot it as low an ISO as possible, okay? And that's just an explanation of what digital noise is, okay? It just happens whenever your sensor is very sensitive and uh, the pixels of light uh, become white because they're too sensitive and that shows up as grains and pixelation in your image, okay? So you want to shoot as low an ISO as you can when you're dealing with macro photography because you want to keep everything nice and clean. You don't want any clutter in the background. You don't want anything to take the focal point away from the subject that you're shooting. And your ISO will play a big, big part in that. Okay, so that's the technicalities of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to blind you with science, okay? It's, it's, it's not about that. It's about encouraging you to get out and have a look at the smaller things in life, okay? And here's another shot of our friend, the carrion beetle. And this, uh, I took this shot the way I did because uh, I wanted to show that long face that I talked about. So it has a long face where it's able to eat its way into a snail shell and pokes its whole head in and eats the snail inside. And you can see how macro photography shows. This, this beetle is about the size of your index fingers fingernail okay so that should give you some sense of scale and it's represented on your screen now as a, a, a big beast uh, lifelike so you can see where the interest comes and you can see what kind of detail that you can get uh, with macro photography I talked about using flash now the reason why and I've used flash on this and the reason why I use flash on all my macro photography and any and most almost all macro photographers will use uh, flash because because we're shooting at f16 and f13 and, and apertures like that uh, and we're shooting slow shutter speeds uh, we need to stabilize the shot and flash gives us that stabilization but it also adds the extra light that's required so even shooting in direct sunlight 
at f16 and iso 100 you're never going to get enough natural light into your photograph so you do need to add a little bit of extra light mobile phones have flashes built in and they will work fine uh, pop-up flashes on your bridge cameras will work fine and a flash gun on top of a normal camera so you all know what a flash gun is and what flashes are uh, but there's a vital important thing and i'll show you it when when you look at my equipment uh, at the end uh, and that is uh, you need to diffuse your flash okay uh, and again i'll answer any questions on diffusers uh, in the the chat but uh, what a diffuser does is it just evens out that light it stops the light being very harsh and it just evens it out so that you don't get a uh, very very harsh light and what the flash has done in this beetle in front of you has brought out all those little orange hairs on its face and on its chest that you wouldn't see with natural light you wouldn't be able to bring those details out okay this is a click beetle and you can see here the depth of field. This is a good illustration of depth of field. So a click beetle is two centimeters long, and we've just about got his face and his eye uh, and a little bit of the thorax in there in focus, and everything else is out of focus, and yet this was shot at f16. If you shot a landscape at f16, you would have everything in focus for miles. So there's the difference in macro photography. This is a woodlouse, okay? Uh, and I'm not sure the European name for a woodlouse, uh, but uh, they're very common in the UK. And this is it up close. Not many people recognise it that close up. Uh, many people look at it and think it's a cockroach or something from a horror movie, uh, which it might look like. But you can see how uh, the detail comes comes out in macro photography. And again, this is there's, there's flash is fired at this. Now you mightn't necessarily think flash is fired at it because there's no there's no big big bright spots on it, but that's because of the diffuser uh, evens out that light and stops it blowing out certain areas of, of the shot. Uh, because you're very, very close to the subject, the macro, you're maybe 20 centimeters from it when you're shooting it. So you're very, very close. And people think, oh, flash, the flash would be too bright, but it won't be because you've got your diffuser and you're able to uh, diffuse that light evenly. So there's a nice, so th this shot illustrates the three things I said. Shot at a, at a high f-stop to get as much in focus as I can get. It's shot with uh, flash, so it's bringing out all those details in the fine hairs. And it's shot at ISO 100, so there's absolutely no clutter, no noise in the background, a lovely smooth background, nothing to take your eye away from what I wanted you to see, and that is the wood lice that's in the image. And this is my presentation coming to a close. I'm not going to talk for very long. I, I don't mind answering your questions and showing you some kit in a minute, but I'm going to leave you with this. This is a leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutter bees are amazing creatures. Uh, they're a solitary bee, and I have them nesting in my garden. And by the way, everything you've seen in this presentation today was shot in my garden. All right. You don't need to go and travel the world to do macro photography. You need to, if you have a garden or any kind of green space or a bush or a tree nearby, you'll be able to see insects and bugs and you'll be able to photograph them. So it's a very accessible way to do nature photography. You don't need to be traveling the world and you don't need expensive kit. But this little leaf cutter bee uh, is it, it's this wonderful creature, has a wonderful life cycle. It nests in little bamboo tubes that I have in the garden and I hatch out every year. They're very, very friendly, they don't sting and uh, they pose very well for photographs. So I do encourage you to put bee nests, solitary bee nests up in your garden because you can encourage these kind of bees to come uh, and you'll be able to practice your macro photography uh, no end in, in the comfort of your back garden. So get a cup of coffee, wait until the sun comes out, get a cup of coffee, get your gear, go in the garden and have a look at your wildflowers and your potted plants and see what insects you can find. So I'm just going to stop sharing my presentation, hopefully turn my camera on. And uh, I would be happy to take any questions. And if you want to make my video the spotlight, I can show some of the guys the camera equipment that I use. Yes, maybe we can, we can have a short look at your equipment. And yeah. uh, then we'll have Anthony's presentation and then the questions. And then questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you can if you can make my video the spotlight or not. So this is a wee bit bigger on the screen, but uh, that there is for the people. If you want to make it bigger, you can click speaker view and you will have in full screen for the people attending. Okay.
So this is what I shoot. I shoot an Olympus E5 digital SLR, okay? And I shoot a Sigma 105 mil macro lens attached to that. And you can see here, I've got a flash gun and that little box on the top of the flash gun just comes off. It's a little plastic box made out of the same stuff your milk bottle cartons are made out of. Goes over the top of the flash and that is my diffuser. And when I talk about diffusing flash, it just simply means that that's on the end of the flash gun and that evens out the light that comes out, stops it being so harsh and stops the shadows and the harsh shadows that are created. So that is what I carry about. People, when I teach macro photography on my courses uh, in person, people look at this and they go, oh, but you must have something else. You must have focus reels and you must have a big tripod and you must have all this. I shoot everything handheld. And uh, sometimes I use the flash gun, sometimes I use the pop up flash that's on the camera itself because it's just handier. And this is all I bring. And it's very, very accessible and very easy to carry about. Some people think that you need loads and loads of gear. And yes, the gear all helps, don't get me wrong. It's, it's great to invest in gear and have it, it's brilliant. But uh, by all means, you can get started. One other little piece of equipment that I sometimes use is this. This is a little clip on lens and I use it with my macro lens and it clips on the front. Uh, these are about uh, 50 euro, okay? And it goes on here and it magnifies everything your lens sees, okay? It's a Rainox lens and it, you can actually put it on any lens and it'll turn it into a macro lens. So if you can't afford the big macro lens, uh, you can buy one of these at 50 euro, put it on the end of your 18 to 55 kit lens, which I'm sure most of you have and you've instantly got yourself a macro setup, okay? So it's very, very accessible, very easy to get hold of. You can buy them on Amazon. I recently just bought that one, so I know they have them. Uh, so that is my equipment, that's what I use in the field, and everything you saw in that presentation was shot using that equipment. Thank you for your time, guys. I hope that was informative. Thank you very much, Danny. So it was really helpful and thank you for all this advice in macro photography. So if you have technical questions, you can also ask them on chat and we'll come back after Anthony's presentation. We'll present on conservation photography. So it will be linked to wildlife photography and actually how you can also make a difference shooting all the, the animal species and how the human impact, how what the human impacts you can also have by these macro photographies. But I will let Anthony more explain this. <laughs> Hi everyone, I oh, hope you guys can hear me well and can still see my screen. Uh, as Christian says that my name is Anthony, I'm from Kenya. I focus mostly on conservation photography. So I'll just take it over where Daniel's left where uh, I'll share more about how far you can take uh, your pictures to, to actually influence uh, conservation action. So I'll share three images with three different stories and how I got the, the stories there. So, so this is an image of, uh, of a bird uh, that I took in Uganda. Uh, and this is part of a project called Traveling for Birds. Uh, so my main aim was actually, how do I make people understand that wildlife actually starts from a doorstep? Uh, and this was a buds uh, created uh, a great opportunity for me to actually share with everybody because uh, most people would uh, resonate with wildlife with only the big five, that is elephants, uh, rhinos and the rest. But we need to think beyond, uh, beyond the big five. We need to realize that uh, wildlife starts from actually our doorsteps. Uh, so if I was using photography to actually link people and conservation science. So this particular project called Traveling for Birds enabled me to actually share images from one point to another uh, about uh, birds. Then the other next assignment I did was uh, in, uh, in Uganda where I was talking about chimps. Uh, so I had an opportunity to visit one of the sanctuaries called Gamba Island in Uganda where we have about uh, 50, 50 chimps at the moment. Uh, but the, the assignment here was to document uh, with pictures what actually happens in the sanctuary and then use those images to actually enable people to support uh, the fundraising efforts of, uh, of Gamba Island in supporting uh, chimps that are in the island and also supporting chimps conservation work uh, across, uh, across Western Uganda. And the other one was mostly about Nairobi River. So this was back in 2018 when uh, plastic ban was 
was really hot on the topic. And uh, this is just an image to show you as an entry image of, uh, of, uh, of uh, how the environment, or how you can actually use pictures to tell environmental stories. So in conservation photography, you need beautiful images, but at the same time, you need to show the threats of actually what wildlife is, is actually experienced, either from, uh, uh, from home or in the parks or any other place you, you, you find yourself traveling or doing assignments. So what's conservation photography? So conservation photography is, uh, is one that has three components. It has the photographic process uh, first, then it has parameters of photojournalism. So you have to be able to tell stories using your images or your images have to be able to communicate uh, a given feel to, to the public or to the audience you're actually targeting. And last but not least, your images need to actually be used to advocate for conservation outcomes. So those are the three parameters for, for conservation photography. So it's actually a sub, a sub of wildlife photography, but it goes, it, go, it goes further to actually be able to uh, share with, with people the importance of conservation. So if you really want to start out uh, doing conservation photography, uh, uh, you've learned about the techniques, you know how to take pictures. One of the things you can actually do is start with your local environment. Uh, uh, don't, don't really go far. Uh, you don't need to go far, tell the story. Uh, talk about things that are in the local environment. So for me, I use birds because you can imagine one day waking up and there are no birds. That is something scary for all of us. But when people resonate that birds are actually important, uh, it makes them want to care and actually continue conserving the environment from where they actually found. So you, re you need to have a goal and an outcome. So in every assignment I do or any, any photography uh, work I do, I make sure there's a goal and an outcome. So for example, the one for traveling for birds, the main outcome of that particular uh, assignment was to make people understand that birds are actually important and you need to conserve them. And birds do not have territories in, in terms of, we cannot make for them territories. They are all over, uh, all over the globe and they fly from one point to another. So we need to conserve those particular habitats that they are found uh, for prosperity. So you need to have a goal and then have an outcome. Then after having a, a goal and outcome, you need to know your role uh, as an individual uh, photographer. Are you going to be the photographer, uh, including the person who's actually creating awareness? Uh, so for example, in the teams, my role was mostly to document. As much as I have a background in wildlife uh, management, I would have helped them with management of the teams, but I didn't go to that particular extent. I stuck to the role of taking images that can actually communicate. Uh, you need to know your limits. Uh, and I talk about limits here, you need to understand where you need to go and uh, or where do you need to go learn uh, about a particular species. Because before you go shooting any particular story, you need to actually do extra research and learn about uh, this particular species before going to shoot them. So you need to know your role, your limits, and actually learn. The other part of it is audience. Uh, one key thing is that when you're taking your images, you need to know where, where you're going to take the image to. Uh, are you going to use it uh, as a because we know everybody takes selfies, so you know your selfies are for your stories and everything else, but, but when you're taking wildlife for conservation photography, you need to think about where can I use this particular image? Who can really be the consumer of this information? Uh, and then you go to another extent and talk about the emotional appeal. Uh, for example, the, the image uh, you see at the moment is, uh, is from Gamba Island. Uh, these are chimps being fed after, after their normal rounds in the forest. So they come back for, for shelter uh, uh, at, at the center of the island. And every single evening as they come in, they come in uh, looking for at least some, some food to just keep them going. And that image has different emotions from different quarters uh, of people. But when you attach it to a story, uh, you enable it to actually uh, have a positive impact on people because uh, we do not want teams to be in, in cages. We want them to be there freely. But these teams are there because of wildlife trafficking. They're there because of, uh, 
of uh, either human wildlife conflicts in particular areas of Western Uganda or DRC Congo. But then they're just here to be taken care of because they can't be taken back to nature to actually survive. So Gamba Island right now is in a state where uh, it needs uh, support because the water levels in the island is actually going up. Uh, and uh, and this, this is the kind of images you'll find me sharing out to, to request people to support Gamba Island, to go to feed the, the, the chims, the 50 chims in the island. Uh, in addition with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic going around and knowing that 98% of, we, we share 98% of, of our DNA with chimps, we can easily transfer this particular disease to them. So this is actually very, very critical uh, to actually be able to use images to ask people to either support and actually make people be aware. So you need to have an emotional appeal on all your images. Uh, just to add an emotional appeal is, is uh, this particular story of the Nairobi River. Uh, you, you get that the river, as much as it's flowing, you get kids playing in it uh, with all the litter, all the sewage and everything else, but they're actually playing in it. So when you, when you take an image that actually shows the interaction between the threats uh, are the people, and then also adding out to look at, uh, uh, at the restoration effort, because this particular story was actually covered to, uh, when you look on your, on your, on your right, uh, I don't know if it's on your right, on your right where there is a green patch. This is a, a particular group uh, that is actually restoring uh, the riparian area of Nairobi River, where they can actually uh, have people enjoy and actually promote people to continuously uh, preserve the environment. Uh, my next question, my next uh, slide is about birds. Birds are beautiful. So to, for you to get uh, that audience to get emotional appeal, you need to have close-ups of the beautiful colors of birds uh, and, different, uh, and different types of birds. So you can have people to actually appreciate how important these birds are. If they cannot appreciate their beauty, they can actually appreciate their, their importance. So uh, I won't talk much about how to actually uh, build uh, a conservation photography story, but as any other story, it has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, but most importantly, when you're talking about conservation stories, you need to have an introduction of the particular species or issue you're talking about. If you are covering about climate change, you're talking about the strikes, you're talking about uh, individual people who are actually uh, advocating for, for, for climate action, you need to do that introduction. You need to mention the threats using images. And last but not least, you need to have the solutions. So conservation photography also includes the human aspect in wildlife conservation. So you go an extra mile to you go an extra mile to, to ensure that people, uh, people appreciate that as much as there is wildlife, we have people that actually support or are continuously working day and night to support the conservation of wildlife. Uh, just to continue uh, showing about how people are important is that there is a, a group of community people uh, working to actually make sure that Nairobi is clean again by removing all the litter, uh, and every 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 other dart within that particular uh, river or riparian area, and this is a, this is a continuing story. So it it goes from one point to another. So this is just a, a screenshot of it, but this is a continuous story. So I'm still taking pictures of these particular stories until today. Uh, talking about the chimps. So this is one chimp uh, called Maisco. Uh, when we were doing. Uh, uh, medical checkups for the chimps uh, at Gamba Island. Uh, one of the things they do is they do a physical body check. And when they do a physical body check, they look at everything else. But uh, we had interns at that particular time who did not know what actually Maisco had gone through. So Maisco is a chimp. Uh, Maisco had no balls, like his balls were removed uh, where he was as, as, as a pet. So that was something so unique and everybody within the room was actually going to, to actually check where actually the balls of, of my school. So that's when I actually took the image of three people trying to figure out where my school's 
balls are, but that's just an interesting story to see how you can combine images and text to actually tell the story. Uh, and uh, realize that it's not just about people's hands on, on, the, on the chimps, but it's, it's, a, it's a broader picture. But if you use a series of more than 10 images, you can easily be able to tell the story. Uh, so one important thing, like any other story uh, for photography, you need to have a storyboard. You need to sit down, uh, figure out your story, and then make a short list of all the images you want to take. Uh, once you have all the images together, all, all the list of images you have, uh, you then be patient. Uh, you have to be patient. You have to do a lot of research before you go shooting. And once you've shot the images, you publish them. Uh, and the most uh, available publishing site we have in the world today is social media. If you can use social media as a tool to actually be able to create more awareness about conservation, it, it propels emotions, it makes people aware, it makes people take action, it makes people take a step extra to actually uh, do conservation action. Uh, again, you can see now the kids from that particular Nairobi River story. They're now enjoying uh, a rehabilitated section of Nairobi River uh, that, that was actually being cleaned. Uh, so you, you see two types of, of comparison in, a, in one particular image. On the left, it's, it's the river that is actually way filthy. But on the right, there are kids who are actually enjoying, uh, enjoying their there's themselves next to the rehabilitated area because this area wasn't looking like this before. So that's that's all I can say about uh, about conservation photography and how you can and get involved. I'll try to use uh, my own stories that I've been I've been doing uh, for the last three years. So I hope you guys have enjoyed it and uh, looking forward to to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony, and really, really nice picture. I think everyone agree with that, and it's really inspiring, and all that you, you took, and also the story behind it's what you pointed out. It's really about sharing a story and about making people aware of uh, things. And uh, maybe you can stop sharing, because we will go to some question on Mentimeter, so you can ask a question, and we'll take also the question on chat. So I'll share my screen. Can you see? No, it's so we will take the the question that has been asked on chat, but if you have more, you can also go on www.menti.com and use this this code. 4386 with your laptops or with your phones. And if you have a question, you can directly ask on uh, this app. And we have other questions about the presentation and some interaction. So Sorry, maybe... just a reminder to present, to uh, click present. Yeah, here. Maybe, Krishna, you can go on, on with the question that I've already been asked. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there were some technical questions uh, for Danny about macro photography. Um, if you have any uh, answers to those, uh, Danny? Yeah, I do. I've made a little note of them because I don't want to miss anybody out. So I think Michael asked a question about ring flash and would ring flash be uh, good for macro uh, as opposed to the flash gun uh, that I use? And yes, it definitely would. Ring flash uh, brings your flash light down close uh, to your lens which is where it should be. Uh, for my particular setup it doesn't work as well because I use a short focal length but for the longer focal length uh, lenses that you get out there for macro photography ring flash is perfect. Nothing wrong with ring flash. Can be a wee bit expensive but they're, they're, they're very good. So to answer that Michael, yes ring flash is, is good if you can afford it. All good. Uh, Louise asked if she could make, is there a way to make a diffuser for the flash on your mobile phone? Uh, very simply, yes, there is. I've done it before, but it, it doesn't look very nice. I mean, it doesn't look nice on your phone. It looks nice in the picture. Uh, and basically what it is, uh, if you get a little bit of milk 
a carton, plastic milk carton, cut it out a square, and just use a bit of cell tape and tape it over where the flash is. That'll diffuse your flash or scotch tape. You know the, the, the white cell tape you get? Stick a little bit of that over your flash as well. I've used that actually on flash guns and things before, and that works really, really well in the field. So yes, you can make a, a diffuser for that. I hope that helps, Louise. Uh, I didn't get the name of the person we asked about having shaky hands uh, and what to do about that. Uh, if your hand, that's the, one of the other reasons uh, the flash is very important because flash actually takes a lot of the hand shape out of photography when you're using it because uh, it, it creates the freezing of motion when you do that. So uh, it's, it's, uh, if you use flash uh, and uh, a shutter speed of around, uh, a shutter speed to the same, the same speed as your focal length. So I shoot at 105 mil, okay? And if you notice that my shutter speed in the presentation was 125, one over 125. So if you shoot a shutter speed that looks like it's equal to your focal length. So if you're shooting a 200 mil lens, put your shutter speed to one over 200 and that takes away the handshake. And then once you add flash, it gets even more stabilized. The other thing is some cameras and lenses have image stabilization built in. Feel free to use those uh, in your focal and they will eliminate the handshake. Uh, two people asked about the lens attachment I showed at the end. That is this guy, okay? Now, I don't know if you'll get from my accent what it's called. It's called a Renox 250, but I'm going to type it in the chat to everybody, and then you can copy and paste that out if you wish, and then that way you'll know what it is. So I'm just going to type it in now to everybody. Uh, it's a Renox DCR 250 uh, macro. Okay? Now, I use that... Uh, on my actual macro lens, which brings it even closer, but you can use it on non-macro lenses and it will turn them into macro lenses or very close to it, okay? Sorry, I've actually spelled that wrong. I will type it in again and spell it right. Uh, that was my bad. Okay. And that's right, I've actually sent that to you, Louise. Could you publish that live for me? Sorry, uh, I've sent it privately to you. Uh, Louise will publish that live for you so you can see that. Uh, and I think the last question was uh, somebody, Esther, I think, asked about the f-stop. Uh, were you correct in thinking that between 11 and 16 is a good f-stop for macro photography? Yes, you, you got that 100% right. Uh, anything... Anything above 10 is good for getting everything in focus. You want to try and get as much in focus as you can. So therefore, the higher f-stop you can get away with, the better. So I should always shoot between 11 and 16. And that is all I have noted down in case any other questions came in. Christina, I didn't see them, but uh, hopefully that answers your questions, guys. I think there was also a very technical question and also for Anthony, someone was asking what lens do you usually use for your photographs, also Anthony. And I saw there was also a technical question to Danny, do you have any tips for shooting very fast insects? Sorry, was that for me that one, Florian? Uh, yes, there was a question for Danny. Do you have any tips for shooting very fast insect? And uh, maybe after Anthony can also answer what lenses he usually uses for his photographs to have. If you use the same thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, for quick insects, I use a uh, continual autofocus. Okay, and a lot of people will tell you in macro to use manual focus. And manual focus is very good because it's very accurate. But I always shoot autofocus. I tend to break the rules a wee bit and shoot autofocus on my insects. Now, if an insect's moving quick and you want to shoot it while it's moving, uh, remember it's always easier to wait until it stops. But if you want to shoot it when it's moving, uh, Set your, your focus to continual autofocus. Uh, I think in Canon cameras, it's AI servo. In Nikon, it's uh, continual autofocus or something like that. Uh, you know, so, and that will track a moving subject. Uh, and then you fire your shots as you need them. Uh, and I did, like, macro does take a little bit of learning. It is quite challenging at the start, but once you get into it and once you get your eye in, you will get the hang of it. But uh, yeah, if you shouldn't move in sacks, that's the best way to do it. Uh, but it is tricky. <laughs> Yes, Anthony. Anthony, if you are here, do you have special also equipment and advice on equipment that you are using? 
Uh, so for me, the equipment, I use a range of, uh, of lenses. Uh, I have uh, a wide lens for about 15 to 16. I have, because uh, I do most uh, uh, in between portraiture and apart from portraitures of people, I also do long ranges of birds. So I have uh, a 150 to 600 mm. Uh, I have a 400 mm fixed of, uh, of Canon and then I have a 50 mm. I have an 85 mm, I have a 70 to 200 mm. So I have a, I have a range of, of, of lenses uh, that I use, but then it depends with the what assignment I'm actually going for. So I choose the lenses uh, depending on the assignment I'm actually going to. There was also an interesting question on chat. If we only have smartphones or mobile devices, uh, how can we use those and what settings can we use for macro photography? Okay, uh, you. I I know that I sh I shoot the Motorola G8 Par. Okay, now I don't know if you can see from there, but you see there's four lenses on that. So there's actually four different cameras, and one of those is a dedicated macro. Uh, so I can manually change the settings on that the same way I can on my digital SLR and shoot the settings that we we spoke about. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a macro close-up lens on your your mobile phone, which most don't, uh, you can get an adapter uh, which sits folds over the top and sits over your lens uh, acts a little bit like the, what what this does for a big camera uh, it sits over the top and can magnify and you can get those for uh, there you can get universal ones or you can get them where they're designed for an iphone or samsung uh, or uh, motorola and yeah and, and they work really well i teach macro photography courses as in in, in like like workshops over a weekend and we always run a competition uh, throughout the weekend and the winner gets a, a, a big print uh, of one of their photographs framed and all uh, for winning and one of our attendees won the competition with a photograph she shot on her iPhone so uh, I was very pleased with that because it proved that you know you don't need to have all the kit what you need is your eye to see the photograph you want to see and the ability to replicate that and she used one of those little clip-on lenses they're about 20 euro they're not expensive and they clipped on over and she photographed a bumblebee on a dandelion flower and it was absolutely amazing uh, so by all means you know you tell your stories anthony told you very well how to tell a story and he spoke really well on that thank you anthony and you know you can tell your story discreetly with a mobile phone so by all means do that do it with macro or you know do it with a wide angle also, Tony, you have raised a lot of questions about your work. And the first I have here is how do you have access to the stories you tell about for your photos? Do you ask for permission? Do they contact you? Because we have seen that you went to some centers for monkeys and stuff like that. So I think it has raised lots of interest. Uh, so first of all, I access my stories is having a passion of, of that particular topic. Uh, once you have the passion of that particular topic, you can easily get access uh, through getting the right uh, contacts. Uh, so there are some that I actually have to source for them, like send emails and request to actually go there. Uh, and then there are some that I'm actually called to actually support. Uh, then there are some that uh, I call them my special projects. So once I do one special project, it allows me to get other similar projects uh, based on that particular project. So how I get them is by doing a project that is local. And then when, once you show it out to the public, somebody gets interested and then picks it up and then can actually contact you to now do a, a, a proper, uh, an, another project with them. So you, you really have to be passionate about the particular topic first before going to shoot uh, uh, anything or well, actually to tell that particular story. Yeah. I think one of the questions was related to that is how can a student, someone start uh, to participate in this type of project? Uh, as starting, it's, uh, just as Daniel said, if you have a smartphone, you have, you, you can easily start taking pictures because there's the, the environmental issues across the globe and we need those particular stories. They can either be stories of people who are doing something positive, a stories of a particular species, a plant, an insect. Try and make it more local to you because sometimes expenses or moving from one point to another can be very, very difficult. So I'll advise if you're a student is try and take advantage of the eco schools. For example, when you want to have the eco schools, take pictures of the eco schools. 
tell stories of what is happening in eco schools uh, programs, uh, how how they are dealing with the COVID nineteen right now, how they are using water, how they are making. So you need to actually be creative and try as much as possible to be local, because it's a local audience that will appreciate you more uh, to actually able to take that particular conservation action. Yeah. And uh, one one of the question was. Uh, how many pictures does it usually take for a project, Tony? Because you say that you were shooting different, uh, like you had different uh, photography, but on a normal basis, how would you consider a project of how many pictures or photographies? Uh, it depends on the time I'm, I'm in that particular assignment. Uh, so in most cases, I find myself shooting over over 2,000 images in one in one assignment, like about two weeks. By on the day, I only need like 10 or my best, my best 20 or, or even 30, depending on the clients. Uh, but in, in photography, especially in telling conservation stories, I don't limit myself to the number of pictures I take because at the beginning, I have a storyboard and I have a list of images I want. So I can be able now to play around to actually make sure at least I get those particular images. Uh, I know there are those that you, can, you can't plan for them, but you can easily, uh, like for example, the portraiture of, of the chimpanzees. Uh, it's, I just wrote a uh, portraiture of chimpanzees, but you have like 50 of them. So making sure that I have all of them in, in, a, in a shot took me a while. Actually make sure that I have each and every person's picture uh, on it. So yeah, you, there's no limit. You can take as many pictures as you want in, in one particular project. I think one question that was also related and could be important is about dissemination that you talked about. So which social media do you think that is better to create awareness on on which platform can we which platform can we use actually? Because we have to we have taken the photo, we want to make the people aware, but how we make it global. So uh, Facebook right now is actually the highest uh, with a number of uh, uh, of users. So for me, I, I, I am comfortable using Facebook, but this is based on preference uh, in uh, who your audience is. Uh, but uh, right now I'm exploring other, with support from my team, uh, I'm exploring other platforms uh, where we have uh, Twitter, we have Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, uh, where you can actually share those particular images. So these social media sites are actually free. All you need is just an, a Gmail account or any email account, log in and then start telling your stories. So uh, there is no particular social media say is, 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 is good. It's you to figure out how best you can optimize the one you use. Yeah. So thank you. There are lots of questions that we will collect after because we also have other questions on Mentimeters to have interaction with you. Oh, is it turning? Oops. So according to you, audience, what makes a good wildlife photograph? How would you take a good wildlife photograph after we have listened to? And uh, all the good advice both from Danny and Anthony. So you can still answer on the on Mentimeters and uh, submit your answers. And if people didn't remain the code, the code is, uh, oops, there's something on it, 4386, so you can still join. So there is the con contrast of colors, a human angle is what we have seen and what is also really important and what we expect from young reporter for the environment story, which, like the human part is really important and what makes the difference. Purple light, love nature is what Anthony said, you have to be passionate and then is also, I think you are both passionate of nature. Detail of the subject matter, a photo that can tell a story. Technique and message to pass on, have a story to tell. Colors, yes, we have seen really good picture with like really amazing colors and nature is full of color. Storyline, emotion appeal, patience. I think it also requires less of patience. I think you can <laughs> tell that. And uh, when a photo gives an angle that viewer is not aware of, 
I think we all, all learn also from your pictures and for me. Uh, investigate your going photograph patients in light. Yeah, lots of, lots of answers. Next question. Oops, what, oh, I can't see it. What animals, insects or plants have you taken photos of? So we know that there might be lots of young reporters for the environment students and we received every year photographs close up about animals, insects and maybe you have photographed your own garden or more, more uh, exotic or we talked about the big five, like everything can be taken in photos. So lots of cats. <laughs> Butterflies, your dogs, bees, flowers, roses, ladybirds, chameleon, lots of butterflies, <laughs> pets, rabbits, ladybirds. Roses, spiders. Spiders can be also really interesting. <laughs> Snakes, lizards, wild herb. So you can see that everything everything can be a subject for photography and close up. And uh, even in your garden, staying at home, you have time to take pictures and explore your local environmental nature. So I think we're Mm, so with your own word now, how would you explain conservation photography and why is it important for you? So most of, maybe most of you didn't know about uh, conservation photography, but I hope you are not now all aware and uh, we learned a lot <laughs> about it. Wait. It inspired over to share an experience with otherwise many people wouldn't see. So yeah. Exploring nature is still which is still undiscovered. To get the importance of the conservation species or habitats, to raise awareness about the beauty around us. Yes, it's exactly what we have seen. Transmit what the world can't explain. Creating awareness, tell a story with pictures, to take photo by wellness. Lots of answers, and they're all correct. Like conservation photography is all about that. Uh, so I think we'll move to the last question because we're running out of time. So if you have any feedbacks, did you like the webinar? You can still answer. And uh, so if you have over question, uh, you can still write on chat and we'll try to collect them. I don't know if Danny or Anthony, you have a last word to the audience, last advice, last tip or message to take away. Just uh, get out there, guys, and look at um, Anthony talked about staying local first, about tell those local stories. And I can't stress that enough. That's so important. Get out in your local, your local patch, as we call it, your patch of land, whatever it may be, your garden, your field. You know, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Have, have a look at what's there and try to tell the story of what's there. I tell the story of my leaf cutter bees in my garden. Uh, you know, and it's a story about how the bees are in danger. And I can tell that through my photography and I can do it while sitting in the garden with a cup of coffee. So, you know, do, do get out there and try it out. Uh, let those photographs tell those stories and get it out there. Get the message out there. Nature can't speak, but we can speak for it. So get that message out there. I also just want to highlight that we uh, had a previous uh, webinar on indoor photography, which also went into the depth of how you can use your smartphone. Um, and if you want to watch that uh, specific webinar, you can find it on our website. Uh, I can write it in the chat. Uh, uh, where we will also share a, a recording uh, of this webinar. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you to the two speakers and 
what I found really interesting about the conservation photography is, is really the, the human angle, because sometimes as uh, young reporters, we might go out and, and take a lot of pictures of, of animals, which is fantastic and great. Uh, but what I found also really interesting is to see, okay, how do humans impact? What, what positive um, action are, are they actually doing in terms of, um, of conservation and having that human angle to it? So I think we're already done with the time. It has been really interesting and we had lots of time for questions, even if we didn't have time to answer everything. So I would like to thank you again, the two speakers of today, Danny and Anthony, for their wonderful presentation. I hope you enjoy a lot everything. And uh, we will also invite you to follow our Instagram and uh, wiry uh, wiry slash int and our Facebook if you want to keep posted about next webinars. And uh, the next webinar will be on the 5th of June about outdoor education and the mental and physical benefits of it. So you are all invited to join us for also interesting presentation. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure. Bye. 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 <laughs>